right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Kristen Dryling. I'm with the Adaptation Thought Leadership and Assessments Project, the USA Funded Outreach Project, um, and we are responsible for hosting the weekly adaptation community meeting. So thank you all for being here today, um, and hopefully that's where you intended to be. Um, I want to thank those of uh, those folks who joined both in person and everyone who's joining us online. Um, so we're really excited to present today's topic. We'll be focusing on Atlas's work. Um, looking at monitoring and evaluation of climate change activities in urban settings. Um, so this is going to be a really interesting presentation. Uh, just a few housekeeping um, items. So one, um, when you uh, joined us either online or um, in person, you noticed that there's a sign-in sheet uh, to join climatelink.org so you can continue to get notices for great events and updates on resources that um, are put out through USAID and other partners. Um, so if you haven't joined that already, please make sure um, these adaptation community meetings happen on the third Thursday of every month. So this is actually our last one for the summer. Uh, we take a bit of a hiatus in August, but we'll be back in September on the 19th, um, where we will be looking at climate services um, in the context of smallholder agriculture farming across Africa. Um, so be on the lookout for that uh, invite forthcoming. Um, and uh, we're going to, after the presentation, we're going to have some Q&A. And so just a note that uh, you will need a microphone when you speak, and I'll be passing that around. We actually have a new touch box toy, so we'll be piloting that and see how we go. Uh, but we're looking forward to this being an engaging discussion uh, following the presentation. So um, bring your questions. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, our USAID activity manager, Kevin Nelson, who's the urban lead at the um, USAID Land Office of Land and Urban. Um, and he's actually joining us remotely. So Kevin, if you are on the line, um, you can... Uh, go ahead and turn on your mic. Okay, great. Can I, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, as was mentioned, I'm Kevin Nelson. I'm the urban team leader uh, with the Office of Land and Urban. And I have the pleasure to uh, continuing this introduction of this session. Um, so I'm, I'm frequently asked by city officials and USAID staff and our missions the question, what tools and resources exist for us to comprehensively implement adaptation strategies that will lead to more resilient and economically viable cities. Uh, of course, people ask that in a, in a variety of different ways, but that's that's the main gist of it, that they're, they, they know that they want to be doing some, um, some resilience planning, some adaptation planning, but, but they're, they're looking for additional resources and systems that will help them get to that. So, Today, we will hear from uh, a panel of speakers who are developing and implementing those strategies, particularly from a monitoring and evaluation standpoint, specifically to get to those effective uh, areas of measurement of those strategies. And we in the, in the land and urban office are excited to bring forward that, um, that systems-based approach to looking at city resiliency, and then also how that um, how that works towards improving not only our built environment but the natural environment as well as we plan for adaptation and mitigation. So, with that, I will um, pass things along to our first speaker. Great, thank you very much, uh, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Owen Scott. I'm the program manager on the Atlas Project, uh, the activity manager for the for this overall activity. Um, <laughs> there we go. So uh, advancing, advancing on. So we're going to have um, four. Four speakers. So Kevin just spoke. I'll be speaking. Uh, we'll have uh, Sarah Mills Knapp, uh, who was the lead author on the literature review. Um, she'll she'll go after me, uh, and then uh, Amy Rose here, who's uh, the lead urban use specialist for the Philippines work. We'll describe the work that we did there. Um, and so the agenda for the for the session follows the the format of the activity. So I'll give a, a brief uh, overview of why we're doing this activity and. Uh, Certain challenges that uh, ME faces in specifically with in, within climate adaptation. Uh, we'll go through the, the literature review and talk about some of the best practices that we identified. Uh, I'll give a brief overview of the, uh, the reference guide that we developed for cities, 
uh, and then Amy will uh, cover, the, cover the case study. So just uh, to give some background on why we did this activity, uh, Atlas as, as a project uh, frequently works with cities, with different countries, with USAID missions uh, on uh, climate adaptation and vulnerability assessments. And we've noticed uh, through our work and through, through research that we've done uh, that there, you know, there's been quite a bit of work recently by cities to develop um, climate change uh, adaptation action plans uh, and to uh, assess their vulnerability to climate change. Um, something that we've also noticed as a trend, uh, you know, it's backed up in, in other literature that we read, uh, is that a lot of these plans either don't explicitly address ME uh, or have uh, an ME framework, but there has been no, no implementation of that. Uh, and so we were interested in digging a little bit deeper into uh, what, what uh, international donors are doing, uh, what countries are doing, what other cities have been doing, uh, and try to uh, use that in our work going forward. So the, the genesis of that, this activity actually came from another activity we were doing in the uh, city of Shwani in uh, South Africa, uh, in which we did uh, an assessment there. And as a follow-up activity, they identified uh, that uh, ME was you know, an area that they were having difficulty with and it was an area that they would like our, uh, our assistance with. And over, over the course of you know, about a year, uh, we tried to work with them, work with them on that, and it, it just it was difficult for them to get to the point even where they could express the type of indicators they, they would want to cover and the sort of assistance they would need. It became clear that you know if a city such as Shawnee was having difficulty, other secondary cities uh, could be having similar issues. And so real real briefly, uh, we've developed three. Uh, documents out of this activity. Uh, the first is a literature review of uh, ME initiatives for climate change adaptation globally. And so this literature review, uh, which uh, Sarah will, will describe, looked at 10 different uh, frameworks that have been developed at the global, national, and uh, city level and identified best practices from that. This one is complete and it's posted on climate links and, and other resources online, so that's publicly available now. Uh, the second document uh, is a reference guide aimed at cities that specifically provides recommendations on how to develop an ME framework specifically for their climate change adaptation activities. Uh, and so this one is completed, uh, but just under undergoing a last few couple changes, so we expect this to be published probably within the next month or so. And finally, uh, the last is specific to the city of Cagayan de Oro in the Philippines. Uh, and this is a, a pilot activity in which we took the reference guide and the best practices that we identified from the literature review and worked directly with uh, a municipality to assist them in developing an ME plan that was tailored to their adaptation action plan. Uh, and this one is we are traveling back to the Philippines in August, actually, to to present the results to the city and to USAID, so that would be publicly available probably in August. So real briefly to, to sort of go through what makes ME for climate change adaptation unique and, uh, and challenging in its own way, um, there are we identified um, six challenges that are specific to, the, to this issue. Uh, and the first is that adaptation actions typically happen over longer time scales. Uh, so it could be a, a large infrastructure project based on uh, flood control that happens in phases over 20 years. Um, it could be uh, just increasing the resilience and the adapt uh, adaptive capacity of city residents. And that could take 20 years, it could take 50 years. So coming up with an ME plan that adequately measures progress towards that over 20 years and over most likely a number of plans, a number of you know, five or 10 year plans of the city uh, presents challenges for, for measurement or validating the results. Um, similarly, uh, establishing baselines for, for adaptation activities uh, has proven difficult because there are so many variables in play uh, in terms of the effects of climate change. Those are changing from year to year. Uh, storm intensities, 
change and they're not necessarily related to climate change. And so one flooding event uh, could be completely different than another. And so coming up with a baseline of this is this is how much flooding is happening now versus how much flooding is happening after these interventions can be difficult to, to pin down. Uh, third is that success and adaptation can be difficult to define. So for example, in the Philippines, uh, in, in a number of the cities that we visited, uh, they have relocation of informal settlements as one of the act, uh, actions in their adaptation plans. And on paper, you know, it, it makes sense in terms of you're, you're relocating vulnerable populations from informal settlements along the riverbank to a different, different uh, you know, less risk prone area within the city. But just simply moving those people from a risk prone area and reducing their risk of that specific hazard equal success for, the, for that population and for that activity overall. Uh, attributing the, the outcome to specific activities are increase, or attributing the in, in increase in adaptive capacity to specific adaptation activities uh, can be difficult and it can be difficult to sort of you know prove the, the causal link between the activity and, and the outcome. Obviously with an M and E that can that can be a, a difficult issue, especially when you're trying to justify funding for a specific activity. Um, similarly, there's a lack of standard language within uh, adaptation with an ME. So for example, on the mitigation side, uh, reduction in uh, CO2 emissions is a standard metric. It's easy to measure, but it is measurable in the sense that uh, the, the, um, the amount of CO2 that's being released can be categorized quantitatively. Whereas on adaptation, uh, there's a different a different understanding of what appropriate adaptation is, what success in adaptation looks like. Uh, and then finally, adaptation actions frequently span multiple departments within a city. For example, an adaptation plan might be led by the planning and development department, uh, but might also involve the environment office, it might involve the housing, housing office, uh, the infrastructure or public works office, uh, and so it requires all those offices to work together, and it requires all those offices to collect m &E information in a uniform way that can all then be uh, categorized by the central office and reported out. And so with that, I will I'll hand over to Sarah, who's presenting uh, remotely, and she can go through the, uh, the literature again. Sarah, it's over to you. Looks like uh, Sarah is having just an issue with her mic. Give us one second. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, sorry about that. Hi, everybody. This is Sarah. Uh, you can just go to the next slide in the room there. So um, I led, um, I was the lead author on the literature review, and I just wanted to go through a little bit about what our um, goal was with the literature review and, the, and what our methodology and process was. Uh, the goal is to examine the experiences of adaptation m and &E to date and um, think about how cities could apply the lessons learned from those frameworks. Um, we started by, we relied on several adaptation m and &E framework reviews that have been um, published and that are cited in the report that helped to kind of us understand what frameworks were out there. And then we applied this um, methodology and criteria to kind of winnow it down to the ones that we thought would be most relevant for us, um, looking at ones 
that had information available pub publicly that were focused on climate change adaptation instead of disaster response or other related topics, and then um, looking at ones that we could really pull relevant lessons learned for the urban context and for urban sectors, and then looking at ones that were really robustly cited and referenced and that had been applied recently. So that did kind of narrow down our focus a little bit. And what we found was really the majority of published experience to date has been um, heavily focused in, uh, from international organizations, which have really been in the game a little bit longer and have had um, more resources to develop really robust frameworks for adaptation in many. And then increasingly, national governments are really moving along in um, planning for adaptation as their, their adaptation plans have been published, and they're looking at how to develop um, adaptation in any system. So we looked at some national government levels. And then moving, um, currently looking at cities, we really found no cities that had, you know, from beginning to end, developed a really fully robust um, results-based framework. And they're there really aren't a ton of city experiences that had yet to be sort of published even publicly that we could find information on. So um, that kind of narrowed down our focus a little bit in the literature review. Uh, the good news is really that this space, I think, is rapidly changing and information is really starting to fill in. Um, recent city experiences have uh, been captured and, and guidance was created by C40 recently. Um, looking at Quito and Joburg and Austin, I think, were the three cities they looked at. Um, and created some guidance for measuring adaptation results as well. So I feel like we're really going to see in the next few years this space um, starting to advance more rapidly, which is good news. So you can move on to the next slide. So I just wanted to go through and look at kind of what the current state of adaptation, what we found in the, the frameworks that we looked at, um, starting with the international organizations. So as I said, you know, they've really been in this uh, a little bit longer and have the ones that we looked at had developed their own sort of originally developed frameworks that were based on um, M&E's best practices, but sort of a lot of really differently developed depending on the context of the organization. Um, most of the organizations are really coming from the purpose of reporting results for donors and for learning for their own, uh, improving their own implementation of projects. So that drive is always, I think, as we say, um, as one of the lessons learned, like the purpose of the framework really sort of drives the design of it. So um, interestingly, these, these frameworks really started out, I think in the early days as kind of much larger, um, the early iterations had a, sort of dozens of indicators and were much larger frameworks and as these uh, international organizations have started to kind of iterate and and learn from implementing the frameworks they have gotten much smaller and focused and honed on fewer indicators that are more easily aggregated up because they're reporting out across a whole uh, global portfolio usually or at least regional so um, they're focused on a mix of both quantitative and qualitative um, mostly outcome indicators and they really um, heavily lean on uh, learning as a strong component and have used the frameworks to do a lot of capacity building within their projects and, and countries, which is, um, which is really interesting and, and a good uh, piece to learn from. So we can move on to the next one. So then looking at national governments, um, what we found is that National government have been sort of taking, kind of, I guess, building on some of the um, experiences of international organizations and, and other um, ME to apply more generic frameworks. So the, the TAMD framework is the Tracking, Adaptation, and Measuring Development is a generic framework that was created. And um, both the Philippines and Kenya are working with international consultants to kind of apply that more generic framework and tweak it and apply it to their context. Um, it's a results-based framework. It has a two-track approach that kind of looks at both how widely um, climate risk is managed in a country and then how successful the adaptation uh, actions are. So it's, it holds pretty close to the best practices that we found. Um, most countries are driven by reporting on their national adaptation plans and their international commitments that they've made and are um, focusing on trying to aggregate from local and regional scale and looking at data from there to aggregate up to outcomes that they can report on across the national adaptation plans. Um, many countries are trying to take advantage of their existing governance and reporting structures, um, especially to try and build on 
um, existing climate mitigation uh, reporting structures. So, you know, countries that have um, the data platforms for reporting on, say, GHG emissions, trying to use that governance structure to also do reporting and, and um, monitoring and evaluation of adaptation. Um, but really, what, what we saw is that these are still really pretty complex and robust frameworks, and, and countries are, the, you know, the implementation has been slow, I think, to date, and no matter what, this kind of requires a large amount of governance and structure to be developed, um, and countries are, are trying to kind of, I think, na navigate within that. Um, Norway was an interesting outlier because their system is actually focused on creating um, frequent vulnerability, vulnerability assessments. So instead of focusing on like a broad results-based framework, they started with just doing um, really frequent vulnerability assessments and then filling in, looking at the changes in vulnerability, filling that in with more qualitative information around adaptation and actions that had been um, implemented. And the last thing to note, most of, um, all of these governments had uh, legal or regulatory frameworks that mandated reporting and that they had uh, built into the regulatory framework to kind of drive um, and focus the attention on it. We can move to the next slide. So coming to the city experiences that we found, uh, like I said, there um, there weren't any publicly available um, information about cities that had established uh, robust results frameworks, but what we found were three cities that had um, kind of approached things very differently, but in a common way. They The three cities that we looked at had started sort of small and with minimal basic uh, structure to look at tracking progress of implementing adaptation actions. So just really looking, um, like in Helsinki's um, example, looking specifically at just process oriented, you know, how much progress had they made on, on the adaptation projects that they identified in their plan. And New York City sort of similarly, and I think uh, we referenced Boston as well, have public platforms in which they, in which the public can go and look at um, specifically maybe like tracking inputs, like how much money was spent on particular projects. Um, and then in New York's case, they've gone a little bit further and looked at some outputs, like um, an increase in linear feed of coastal defenses or something like that, um, where they have been able to, you know, go a couple steps further than just looking at whether something was implemented or not, or but putting a little bit more quantitative um, rigor to it. I think Rotterdam is kind of the furthest along, and they are looking at a pretty complex um, set of indicators, um, like looking at changing risk, at achieving targets, looking at the inputs and outputs, and then looking at effectiveness, so outcome indicators um, for the multiple hazards that they show within their adaptation plan. So the approach is are really different, but I think what we saw was that most, you know, tried to start small and quickly as they were needed to track what was being implemented in terms of adaptation actions and then really focus on public reporting and transparency. Um, and all of these cities and, uh, and other cities that we saw are have a long-term vision of implementing a more robust framework but are in the meantime kind of putting together and, and leveraging existing data systems to um, do what they can for now. So next slide, that brings me to the kind of key takeaways that we that we came to from the um, from the literature review. So really one of the things that we saw, and I think that is most important, is that cities really need to act fast. Um, as I was making these slides, the uh, flooding in DC happened a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if it affected any of you, but it really, um, I saw this tweet about the National Archives, and it really kind of resonated with me as I was thinking this through, that, you know, it's, it's really important to act fast, and I think cities don't really have the luxury of spending time creating robust frameworks. Um, they need to be implementing active, uh, adaptation actions now, and they need to be understanding how those are going to be protecting the population. Um, so I think that is the message, you know, not to wait around and try and establish, you know, a fully robust system, but to work within the data the structures that they have now, the governance structures to see what they can do quickly. Um, and then finding the right balance between robust and, and practical cities obviously have a lot of other things that they're trying to track and understand and work on. So being realistic about what cities can really accomplish. Um, 
also, so I think what the national level governments have gotten right is what can really help is a, um, making it the law. So creating some sort of policy or regulation that demands regular reporting can really help at least align and, and prioritize this for agencies you know, within city governments that have a lot of other things going on. And it gives people an incentive and a mandate for action. So next slide. So what we found, um, especially in the case of international organizations, is that you know good practice in general um, M and E is is pretty much applicable to urban adaptation actions as well. But you always need to think of kind of what the local context is going to be, um, especially when it comes to thinking through the capacity for data collection and the capacity to have you know, many layers of governance. I think um, being realistic about what cities can implement while trying to you know focus on best practice it's a, there's going to need to be a balance between those there's really no one generic framework we thought that we could find that would work for all cities um, because the impacts that they face are so different and the um, the context that they're working within are so different but what we found in general is that you know a results-based framework that that builds from a theory of change and has a strong understanding of the inputs and outputs and outcomes of um, the system can really help set cities on the right path. And then um, I think obviously early preparation, I think the earlier cities are cities are in the adaptation planning process, the earlier they think about m and &E and start planning for it, the better off they'll be. But as you know, early preparation is key, I think flexibility is also really important. Um, the, you know, cities will find, I think, especially as we said, the, the purpose of the framework is really what drives the design of it, but the purpose of the framework may shift and change. Um, and so being able to be flexible and, and what we saw with the international organizations that they, you know, have started out with these really robust frameworks and then scaled back, I think, in just like that, cities will need to, um, you know, continually sort of revisit and reassess whether the framework is working for them, and if there are new impacts they're looking at, um, or or new governance structures or new things that are happening. I think you need to sort of adjust within that and make sure that that the framework remains flexible. And then um, again, in in terms of like early and deep stakeholder engagement, looking at um, creating the right governance is really essential and sort of eases the way for um, implementing these programs. Um, wide and deep stakeholder engagement is really essential. I think making sure that the right people are at the table in the early discussions around the theories of change and what, um, you know, what are, you, are cities really trying to achieve with adaptation actions, that can really help the discussion of indicators. So making sure the stakeholders are engaged really early and um, have input in those processes is really key, is what we found. So that's kind of a brief overview. There's a lot, there's some other takeaways in the report, and I'm happy to answer questions at the end, but that's kind of the highlights for now. Great, thank you, Sarah. So from, from the literature review, um, in, in the, the research that we're doing from the literature review, uh, we noticed that there, didn't seem to be a lot of guidance aimed directly at city officials on how to go about setting up uh, an ME framework or adaptation for the city, for the cities. Um, GIZ has quite a bit of good guidance, uh, in, uh, particularly around uh, indicators and around uh, linking some of the results from a vulnerability assessment to uh, adaptation action. Uh, and as we were writing our report, our, our guidance document, uh, C40 also came out with a guidance document uh, that takes a slightly different angle at it and starts with uh, you know, identifying a hazard and then developing actions and monitoring the uh, actions from there. Um, but we wanted, to, we wanted to develop a guide that would be sort of toe the line between easily accessible and uh, provide enough guidance that city, city officials could get started on developing a, a framework or at the very least identify holes within their own expertise to bring in consultants to provide guidance in certain areas. Uh, and so the, the focus of the reference guide is not to, not to provide a step-by-step -step, 
guidance on how to create an M&E framework, but rather to sort of uh, highlight the essential elements of what an M&E framework and an M&E system should contain, and then specifically provide guidance on how to tailor those, those uh, different elements of the system to their adaptation activity. And in, in writing the guide, uh, we, we felt that m and &E is sort of a, it's a, it's a, a midway point in, in the work that cities doing in, in their adaptation planning. Um, so really before they, they jump into developing an m and &E system for their adaptation activities, um, these three things are, are, are fairly, uh, are, are required for them before they, they begin. One of which is to have identified adaptation actions that's contained in the plan, but uh, to have you know, a plan of what their adaptation activities will be, to have a, a sense of how long they're gonna take, we'll be implementing them, so that you can then be begin lining up indicators to measure the impacts of these activities. Um, it's important to have have conducted a, a climate vulnerability uh, assessment before uh, the m and &E begins to, at the very least, assist in establishing baselines as much as possible uh, to provide some an evidence base for the, their evaluations uh, going forward. Uh, and then finally, uh, to, to conduct an assessment uh, in terms of how rigorous this assessment is, we don't, we don't specify the type of assessment, but they need to do some sort of internal stock taking of what their m and &E capacity is currently. Um, are they, in other areas, are they already collecting data from uh, at the community level? Uh, are they using the, the data that they do collect for decision making? Uh, are, they are they collecting uh, outcome and output indicators, or is their m and &E more focused on financial and progress reporting? Having a sort of a general sense of what their overall m and &E capacities are provides a good, a good starting point to develop a system specifically to adaptate. So this is the general structure of the, of the reference guide. It's organized uh, by eight different sections. Uh, and these are sort of the essential elements of developing an m and &E system. And this is true of really any, any type of m and &E system, uh, including adaptation. Uh, and so that's organized in three buckets, sort of the, the considerations they need to take when designing the framework, um, the elements that they need to have in place when they begin implementing the, the m and &E system, uh, and then uh, after they've collected, been, been collecting the data for a while, uh, some guidance on evaluation and on learning based on the, the results of their, of their efforts. So I won't go into, into what each category uh, contains um, because it's in, in the guide, but um, to give you just an example of sort of the, the breakdown under each one of those sections, uh, it's organized by key recommendations. So these are just a quick number of, of bullets to provide um, quick and easy uh, information for a city official to reference on sort of what are the what are the key takeaways from developing a data collection plan? What are the key, uh, key takeaways uh, to develop indicators that are mapped to adaptation activities? Um, the guidance provides more specific recommendations as does the best practice, and these draw directly from the literature review uh, based on the, uh, the systems that other, other cities and countries and donors have in place. Uh, as well as what's worked in, in those systems and what hasn't. Uh, and then lastly is, is to provide resources. Um, so I mean, often the, the people tasked with developing an m and &E plan for, adap for adaptation might not necessarily be those with the knowledge, specific climate change adaptation knowledge. They are very likely m and &E people or people in the planning department. Uh, or people on the technical working group that's developing the overall plan. So the resources help link them up with uh, sources of data that they can use, uh, uh, examples of theories of change, uh, examples of the type of work that other cities have undertaken and the type of expertise that they needed to carry out the development of their m and &E systems. Um, 
with the idea that after going through each one of these four recommendations, a city official isn't going to be able to sit down and, and just begin writing a theory of change, but that they have all the resources sort of at their fingertips um, to know where to go to sort of dig deeper in, in each, into each one of those topic areas. Uh, the next two slides are just some, some quick examples of what's in the, in the reference guide, just to sort of provide um, a couple of quick snapshots of guidance that's provided. So for example, under setting up an institutional arrangement, we pull from some of the, the, the countries and cities we looked at, provide some examples what has actually been done and, and, and give, some, give some ideas of what's worked, what hasn't worked based on those structures. For example, the institutional structure that, that Kenya's put in place um, to sort of uh, illustrate the number of departments that are uh, involved in their efforts as well as uh, give, give an idea of the, the type of expertise that's needed. Um, similarly, just to, to sort of give an example of essentially what a technical working group scope of work would look like. So if a city looking to create a, a technical working group around m and &E or even around uh, developing an adaptation plan, these are typical, you know, these are examples of typical types of functions that a technical working group in, for adaptation would require. Similarly in the data collection uh, section, uh, just a, a few sort of ideas for, for city managers. That these are the essential components of what a data collection plan looks like. Uh, and then specifically where they might go to find the information that they need to inform uh, their, their data collection efforts. So if they're collecting information on, the, on what effect their flood control measures are having, uh, then these are some, some areas that they can, they can start. And so obviously this will be, there are different, different levels of expertise at you know, the city level, all the way from sort of a smaller secondary city or even a tertiary city in a, in a different country um, to uh, you know, a larger city in South Africa, for example, to reference the previous uh, example. Um, and so some, some of the information will, will likely be known to cities, some, some won't, but we wanted to, to ensure that this would reach as many, many people as broad of an audience as possible um, and uh, hopefully assist more probably at the, the secondary city that's, that's struggling to come up with any type of M&E for their adaptation action uh, versus a city that's uh, a couple, a couple of steps ahead. So the, as I mentioned, the reference guide uh, we're looking to have out within the next month or so. Uh, and so at, w at which point it will be available uh, on, on climate links and hoping to uh, work with USAID to get this out to, to missions and, and hopefully work with some, some other cities uh, to put this in their hand and, and receive some feedback on, on the effect of this work. At this point, I will, I'll hand over to uh, Amy to go through the, the organization. Right, so, um, you know, our first step, Owen and Sarah conducted a literature review, uh, then we have a reference guide, and then the, this step that you're going to hear from me about is where we attempted to pilot this, these ideas about how to set up an adaptation plan for a city, uh, and the type of city that we think, you know, had enough capacity to have a change that really needed to be made. So I'm going to tell you the story about our first year at CBO, and then we'll talk a little bit about how CBO is Um, so, uh, here's, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the m assessment that we conducted and the results there. Uh, out of that assessment, there were three key design considerations that came together that I think would be important to share with you. And then, finally, uh, we put in recommendations to social city and also donors to the city to help with that. To set the framework, though, here, um, before we went to the CBO, what we knew about the city was that it had recently put a lot of effort into developing a local climate adaptation plan. They had help from Human Habitat in doing this, and this is actually a requirement of the government of Philippines. So uh, that really sparked interest in the city as a 
world pilot area. Um, you know, they recently put together this plan, and it's just uh, what we saw was that often there are times when we don't have a comprehensive Um, the assessment was conducted by myself and Owen in April. We spent one week down in studio. Uh, there, we talked to a number of people, but mostly city officials, as well as a few CSO representatives uh, and uh, some folks from Xavier University out there. Um, before we went, we did take a look at this local uh, climate change adaptation plan, action plan, sorry. LCCAP is what we and all of the folks in studio refer to it as. And we also looked at other key documents uh, that you know, surrounded the city's general m and &E systems or, or what they've described to be m and &E systems. Um, what our plan when we went down there was to use the measure evaluation m and &E capacity assessment tool that they had as our framework for the assessment. And we had to adapt it quite a lot because NUCAD is actually pretty sophisticated and it assumes the system um, is pretty robust. We already knew going into uh, the city that a lot of those uh, elements in NUCAT wouldn't be found. And so we simplified it quite a bit. And with the NUCAT, we were able to use both a systems uh, assessment tool and an individual assessment tool. And in addition, we had a bunch of city informal interviews, 29 people in total over the week. Um, just below here, for your interest, um, we have different topics that we covered, things you would expect, so organizational capacity and human capacity for M&E, uh, you know, things like was there routine monitoring and what did that look like, what about databases, surveys and surveillance. So these are the sorts of topics that we talked to folks about as we were in studio. There were a lot of results here that I could talk to you about, but I wanted to tell you about some of the headlines. Um, you know, remem remembering that the purpose of an m &E system is really to inform decision making, right? So within about a day or two, it became um, pretty, uh, it became uh, obvious to us that we had a couple of important missing elements uh, to the city's efforts um, for climate change adaptation. Um, first of all, there was no funding for the LCCAP. It's mandated by the government, but it doesn't come along with any dedicated funds. Um, there were no reporting requirements, so cities had to put together a plan, but they didn't have any reports that they had to submit up to the higher level. Um, and really importantly here to, to all of us in the room and online to keep in mind is that there was no real authority, uh, no office, and no individual who was mandated to be responsible for implementing this plan. And when those things came about, when we began to understand that, we thought, okay, there's a big problem. Of course, if you're going to go through all of the effort to develop an M&E system, the whole purpose is to inform the work that you're doing, your decisions, your funding, your programming. And if there is no system or managers uh, to report to, and there's no accountability that's expected, so there's no demand for those results, uh, then I think you're, you're kind of stepping into a situation where you're creating something for, for a, a purpose that's not quite clear. Um, so that was one of our, our major takeaways. Now, um, we could be forgiven for this mistake. Uh, but, you know, a lot of things were there in the reports that we reviewed. So there was a lot of discussion of an ME system. Um, the city itself has uh, the City Project Monitoring and Evaluation Committee, uh, which sounds like they are doing evaluations and they are monitoring the different uh, outcome indicators, for example. But in fact, and I don't think that this is, uh, this is fairly typical, I, I would think, um, this monitoring was really of financial uh, tracking and physical accomplishments. So what they termed M&E, and, &E, and that, that term is used a lot, is actually not what we were thinking of as M&E. So um, when we went in and talked to folks on the ground, we realized, you know, actually the city's not really set up to do what we consider to be M&E. &E. So I think that's important for us all to keep in mind. Even when we look at documents, we realize that sometimes um, that's not quite the case on the ground, and, and that's what we found in studio. However, you know, we did find some really positive results, too. We found that there is some organizational and human capacity for m and &E. There are folks who are a bit more aware than maybe even the staff a few years ago. And there's leaders who are really committed to this idea that they know that they should be using data more for decision-making. So 
So quite a few things that, that led us to believe that there is um, there is room to grow in m and &E and there's some, some willingness to do so. So, um, you know, our challenge then was what exactly are we going to suggest? We've, uh, we've looked at uh, CDO and we see that um, that just generally the city lacks capacity, lacks an M&E system that could be used. And we see that the LC cap really lacks um, some, some actual uh, structure in which it's going to be managed. Um, so we did two things. We outlined some steps that we thought could be taken now under the current conditions in order to um, promote a, a culture of M&E um, that I think is really important as you, you even think through uh, a future in which the city is going to be doing more M&E, possibly. Um, and then we also outlined some steps that CDO could take if LC cap was actually actively managed. So if some of those major limitations were addressed, um, here's what that plan might look like, and that might help the city government to think through their next steps. One of our choices was to base the M&E system on the National Climate Change Action Plan. Um, we thought, you know, there already exists a results-based monitoring and evaluation system at the national level. And so whatever we create at the city government level, level or what we suggest should best fit into that. So one of our first steps was to look at that RBMES, as it's called, and crosswalk it to what the city is actually doing. So which strategic priorities is CDO actually working toward? And which of their programs, projects, and activities would sort of fit into the existing national framework? I just want to go through a few of the recommendations that we made to the city. Um, one thing we noted uh, was that this was a good sign. With the relatively new mayor, um, he had his own agenda that he called Prime Hat. I don't remember what that stands for, but it was a pretty much a, a citywide agenda for his, what he wanted to achieve. And there were some things peripherally related to climate change there. But this was something that he required a report on every year. Every department was mobilized to contribute to that report. And so we saw that as an, as an opportunity, really, to say, um, let's, let's suggest that maybe you make it just a step more systematic. Instead of just asking department heads to contribute whatever data they think is interesting, maybe take that as an opportunity to uh, write down indicators you're going to track every year based on this agenda that's important to the mayor with the idea that things that are really important to the mayor are probably going to get done at the department level. And that helps build a culture of M&E. And so the other thing related to that is we suggested that the mayor and other department heads can start using that data in discussions and in meetings. Um, we heard over and over that people say, we don't understand why we're being asked to collect this information. Uh, and so um, we thought that you know, by demonstrating that data is being used, it can help to uh, promote this, uh, this uh, culture of, of data appreciation. Uh, the, the City Project Monitoring and Evaluation Committee that does exist really could use some help to covering all of the responsibilities in its TOR. So we outlined a few different options for the city. And we said it's very important that m and &E responsibilities are accurately uh, written down into job descriptions. And uh, there must be some training to allow folks to have those basic skills to, to actually do their m and &E job. Even if they're not an m and &E staff person, they probably do have some responsibility related to monitoring. And finally, we also said that uh, you, know, you, you need to develop just a few staff members within the city who can become more of M&E experts. Maybe they're the folks you turn to uh, when you want to write a scope of work for an evaluation, for example. Uh, oh, and then the last thing there is that uh, you know, where they did have these uh, PPAs, programs, projects, and activities that were in the LC cap, um, we suggested perhaps the city could prioritize funding of those particular activities. If there isn't uh, dedicated funding, that's another way to make sure that uh, climate change adaptation is, is recognized. And then just finally, a few things that we recommended to USAID. Um, you know, in the short term, the city really needs um, more than just a one-week trip uh, from Owen and me. We're going to try our best when we go back. Uh, but they really do need a couple of months of dedicated uh, TA if they want to take these recommendations and, and address them. Um, and, you know, one thing we also said might be useful even if uh, you know it doesn't make sense for climate change adaptation to 
uh, have a full M&E system, it might be useful to just hire a consultant to gather certain indicators at this point, maybe next year as well, so that in the future, when the city's ready to, it's got some organized data that it can turn to as baselines, for example, or to inform future plans. And in the long term, um, we did note that whereas there's no office in charge of CCA, there is a city a department for DRR, and they are funded, they have staff, they actually even have some indicators written down that they don't track. So we said, you know, one thing is you might, you know, support these folks to, uh, to actually implement their m and system, and of course that would have some bearing on the CCA as well. Uh, overall, uh, you know, the bigger problem here is that the government of the Philippines has required this plan but hasn't really set out any of the other um, structures that would help it be successful. So that is something that maybe USAID Philippines could take up and to make some suggestions on how that would be more um, efficient for the cities and uh, for the government as a whole. And I think um, there's another opportunity there. You know, what we're finding or, or what happens um, based on our results um, may be useful for other cities in the Philippines. And so there's an opportunity to scale some interventions that seem promising. That's all for me. The other two are forthcoming. Sorry about that. Forgot the mic. Um, so, but just to sort of wrap up how Kagai and Oro fits into the, the overall theme of the activity, uh, Kagai and Oro is, is not uh, unique. It's not unique in the sense that it, it lacks some any capacity. It's not unique in the sense that it, uh, you know, it struggles to fund the activities for climate change ad adaptation. Um, it's not unique for other cities in the Philippines, and it's not, it's not unique for other other similar cities, uh, especially secondary cities in, in other developing countries, and frankly, in developed countries as well. Um, I think it was Helsinki's system, if I remember correctly, is a series of emojis, and that's how they report out their the, the status of their uh, adaptation efforts. Which is not to say that that's uh, a bad thing. It's just it's a difficult uh, and, and fairly new uh, <laughs> uh, field uh, to, to work in. And so the, the recommendations that we provided for Kagai and Doro uh, and, and, and what we found in the literature review are, are broadly applicable to a, a range of cities out there uh, in the sense that they are, um, they understand that uh, climate change is an issue. Uh, they, they understand the risks that are in their city. Um, they've made some steps to start trying to address those risks uh, and, de and decrease the vulnerability of, of the residents of the city. Um, but at this point, there, there's very little progress made uh, at the city level in terms of understanding what impacts these actions are having. Are these cities spending their money in the most uh, resource efficient way? Uh, and will the sum total of these activities eventually result in a more resilient city? Um, so we hope that um, from, you know, from the case study, uh, the reference guide, and the literature review, uh, that this will be useful for, uh, for donors, for cities, national governments, uh, and uh, you know, anybody else in the room or mind who is working on this project. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Owen, Amy, and Sarah, and Kevin as well for your presentation. This is great. Okay, so with that, um, we're going to open it up to uh, everyone for questions. We have this fun box um, that it will serve as our microphone, um, and you can throw it, but I don't recommend that we try that out. Um, so just if you need the mic, you can go ahead and just pass it to us. And, oh, sorry, please uh, state your name and where you're, you're from before you pass it. Thank you. My name is Ozma Kuzakal. I'm from my um, I have two questions and one comment, actually. So my first question, uh, have you also considered the developing uh, countries' activities? Because especially the city is not unique. 
the city level we had here in Europe, but I want to have a level transfer some level of knowledge. Uh, second question. Uh, I understand that the, you know the uh, the presentation and actually the, um, the, the the main purpose of this study is on MME. But I wonder uh, before coming to MME system, has, uh, what do you think about the overall robustness uh, of the adaptation plans, especially at the city level adaptation plans? Currently, in global, right? I mean, uh, at global level. What do you think? How robust the city level adaptation plans are? And uh, one comment, uh, actually two comments. Uh, MNE is really very important, uh, but I think it's very important to to integrate this concept just at the beginning of the uh, uh, local level climate change adaptation plan preparation stage, right? Because uh, what I have seen uh, uh, in, in my career is that you know usually the plans has like uh, qual qualitative, uh, maybe you know some verbal statements about the actions that need to be done, and the uh, the usually the, the, the reactions of the uh, the authorities is just to put a check mark if those actions have been considered. But if it, if, if it is being introduced at the very beginning of the the, the adaptation plan preparation, uh, what are the indicators? What are the uh, who are responsible? What is the deadline? What is the outcome? Measurable outcome and so. It is important to, to, to introduce it from the from the very beginning. And at this stage, uh, national governments have some much more guidance and maybe motivation uh, because of the uncertainty. They have to do some reporting and you know, there are some certain uh, structures for that. But um, I think for the, uh, the, the the local level, uh, there is not enough motivation, right, for those uh, people to go through such detailed assessments for the you know, climate change adaptation and so. So my com comment maybe or suggestion at that stage would be to to to, to propose or to use the RM approach, climate risk management, which is the CRR, a disaster risk reduction and climate resilience, I would say, not adaptation, but because I feel like climate resilience is much more proactive than the adaptation plans, so let's not be reactive. So so maybe introducing CRM approach at the city level uh, because they already, like as you mentioned, in the city council they have some CRR activities or the institutional or you know the structure uh, in our place to see how they can see the need for this. Thank you. Yeah, I mean I th those are those are great points. So I, I think I answer the the two questions um, in terms of. Uh, First question was about um, uh, looking at systems in uh, ME systems in developing countries, and we really struggled to find any that were actually functional. Um, so there were quite a few in developing developing country cities uh, that are on paper and that are you know have, have are high quality uh, and um, have received support from from. Donors and, and other institutions that you know, provide uh, good support, uh, but outside of, of really the, the the few that we listed and, and a couple others, uh, there didn't seem to be any that were actually collecting information and reporting out publicly. Uh, I mean, even for uh, on New York City, for example, um, their their public reporting on that started in 2017. So um, we wanted to as best as possible include not just systems that were sort of uh, theoretically good, but try to draw some some, uh, some lessons from systems that were actually being being implemented. Um, in terms of the, the second second question about uh, what do we think of the quality of the adaptation plans, I guess to be frank, we kind of had to close our eyes to that question a little bit uh, because that was sort of outside of the scope of this uh, this activity. And so it, that kind of gets to your, your point about uh, the entry point of this sort of work. Um, and I, I think we definitely agree that how many should be considered as part of the overall planning process. Um, but where we were sort of trying to focus this was that uh, on the cities, and at this point there are quite a few that have adaptation plans, 
uh, but have maybe a one-page M&E write-up at the end of that plan that's sort of, you know, to be continued, dot, dot, dot. Um, so we, we sort of wanted to, to target cities at that stage that were, uh, that either have a plan or even are already implementing these activities, but doing so in the dark somewhat. Um, and so this was to try to, you know, try to hit them at that stage of, okay, you've developed a plan, the plan is of differing quality. Uh, I mean, for example, the plan in Kagai and Oro is not great, to be, to be honest. You know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of work that could be done to it, uh, but it's their plan and that's what they're putting, putting money into. Uh, and so at this point, we wanted to at least help them understand that yeah, for current action and then for future planning purposes, here's what impact, if any, your adaptation actions had, and here's how you might improve that in future iterations of it. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question online. Hi, yeah, this question is from Sarah, and she, her question is, what type of specific indicators do you feel might be good and feasible ones that might be possible across many cities? And perhaps, like, what would you consider a great indicator, the low-lying fruit, or like an indicator of where you want to start? That is a really good question, but I think it's important to keep in mind, it's got to be, it's hard to answer that, um, just generally. We, we did spend a lot of time thinking through what were the exact actions that the city was planning to take. Um, now that's, that's my response to how you track certain, uh, the results of certain actions. Um, I think there's a lot of good guidance that, is, that um, we've discussed that can give really specific types of indicator suggestions depending on the types of actions that a city or another government unit is trying to take. Um, so there are some resources out there. But I think the most important thing is to have uh, at the top level, you know, your, your goal and outcome indicators to be motivational and to really represent what it is you're trying to do. And what's the kind of element? For example, uh, in studio, one missing element I would say, we, we should say, out of their plan um, was it didn't give a lot of uh, guidance to what they wanted to achieve, even aspirationally. So for example, it had a, a lot of um, risk maps. Um, but not an expression of what they wanted to achieve in terms of the actions that they were going to implement in their city. Um, so that's a long-winded way of saying, I, I think you have to really look at the specific situation and match the indicator to the exact goal, uh, to the exact action, and hazard. Yeah, hi, this is Sarah. I just wanted to add a little bit to that. Um, I think that's really right, Amy, that it, it is really context specific, but um, the guidance document when it's published should have, um, I think, uh, oh, and just confirm that it's still in there, but should have a list of some sample indicators uh, in the appendix. And then the, the C40 report that we have referenced also has a lot of examples um, for cities at the end of it that are really helpful. So I think looking at those two, um, uh, resources can help cities start thinking about what might be possible for them. Um, and then what we saw was really cities that are just starting out really focus on sort of more process um, indicators. So looking at, um, like we said, sort of progress, like was this activity actually implemented? And then um, something like looking at the inputs, how much money was spent on it, and then some additional um, output type of things like, um, you know, how much vegetation was planted, how many feet of coastal defenses were um, installed, so something that's a little bit more basic, and then cities are really developing more towards outcome-based, um, really looking at um, whether the sort of the essential uh, situation was changed or not. So that's kind of like what we saw as the progression of how cities are developing. And there'll definitely be resources to um, look at indicators in the the resource guide when it comes out. Right. Th this is Kevin from USAID. Just along those lines, I, I just wanted to ask or point out from a from an operation standpoint, thinking about the cities themselves. And I know that you know we we have limited examples, but. Well, you know, one thing that I think potentially can go a long way, you know, in terms of getting to um, 
you know, some outcomes is to really look at that behavior change within the the organizational system of the, you know, of the jurisdiction. And, and I'm not talking about just, you know, like silo busting, but my experience has been that once, you know, once you, once you start framing things, you know, beyond just what, you know, what we may consider standard adaptation, you know, viewpoints, that that might, that might lead to outcomes in terms of investments or planning or, um, you know, things of that nature in terms of what, what the city, you know, what's in the city's manageable interest within their own jurisdictions and their own operations. And then beyond that behavior change at the, you know, at the resident level, which, you know, many of these outcomes are, are really trying to, to get at. Um, I had a question to this nice box. Um, the literature review was focused on climate adaptation, not disaster response. And I, w I was wondering why, because the CDO city example shows that DRM can be a very decent entry point, and, and it often is. Uh, secondly, uh, while the CDO only focused on capturing financial and physical accomplishments, did they at least make use of that data? And, and I'm asking that because it doesn't always need to be our Western style m and &E system uh, that works, especially not as a starting point. Um, on, on the C40, uh, ISO also has indicators for sustainable development and resilience in cities as a norm. And um, Andy Gain has the urban adaptation assessment framework, which has a number of indicators. And there are a few more uh, that will be published in the adaptation flagship report in September of the Global Committee on Adaptation. Um, Sure. Um, uh, the question was about uh, you know whether that that M and E committee's focus on financial reporting and physical accomplishments um, you know might have been appropriate. We absolutely think it's appropriate. In fact, um, as you were describing you know how the committee came about, um, it was just in the last few years, and it was really a tightening of um, making sure that contracts were paid uh, based on good evidence that work had been done. You really have to start with step one before you know you go to to looking at outcomes, which are a lot harder to track. So uh, I, I think we didn't feel like that was misplaced at at all. Um, we felt like that was the right action for them to take um, in terms of, of of focus, and um, they had really done a lot to improve that tracking system, and they were making use of it again to make sure that contracts were paid appropriately. So that was an accomplishment that they had. And pretty recently, and so we said, well, the next logical step is to uh, go back. Let's see what what all is in the TOR. What's the next logical step? The next thing probably wouldn't be, you know, develop a uh, comprehensive evaluation plan. No, but um, you know, based on that, maybe um, incorporating some additional output, more qualitative or more complex output indicators, or a few outcome indicators. Um, or just even having discussions that are at a higher level of you know, these are all the activities. Are they meeting our overall objective? I think that's really, really key that uh, we don't lose sight of the whole point of m &E, is to have that larger discussion with data. Um, and so I think our, our suggestion would be to not insist on something really uh, robust with tons of indicators from where they are now, um, but to push them in the next step that they can make. So the, to answer the, the first question, uh, why adaptation uh, as a starting point instead of DRR, uh, I mean, to a certain extent, um, it's sort of that's what our project is focused on is adaptation, not DRR. So that that sort of you know drove that angle, um, but also it's it's just you know despite that uh, DRR you know has been around longer, there's generally more resources towards it uh, that. That didn't change the fact that cities also have these complementary adaptation plans um, that are that have resources going towards it, that have activities going towards it, and are, are sort of being implemented at start. So, um, you know, at the actual sort of action level, you know, the real world level, um, you know, both in the in the recommendations we provided to the CDO uh, and in the uh, reference guide for city managers, we we you know explicitly say that DRR would be a good start. 
often there's overlap between sort of a, a prevention section of the DRR plan, uh, a mitigation section of the DRR plan, and the adaptation plan. So there are you know, duplicate activities or even complementary activities. You could sort of leverage the most like, you know, more likely uh, well-funded and staffed DRR office uh, as, an, as an entry point to begin collecting this sort of data and uh, you know, systematizing the, the data collection process uh, for uh, your, your adaptation plan. So that was, uh, I, won't, I won't say that was our, our original thinking. You know, we were sort of driven by the focus of our project, but after sort of getting in there and doing the literature review and doing the work on the ground, um, it's sort of we, we inserted that into the, the plan. Uh, we have another question from online from Anthony Kazoro. Um, his question is, did you find instances where some cities are doing M&E unconsciously in their adaptation planning in other sectors? And this might be for more Owen and Sarah. Sarah, do you have a, a thought on that? Sorry, can you just repeat the question again? I didn't quite hear. Uh, did you find instances where some cities are doing m and &E unconsciously in their mm -hmm. adaptation planning in other sectors? Hmm, it's a good question. I mean, I think what we saw is that, especially in the case of, you know, some more developed cities like uh, New York City, like there is certainly um, adaptation m and &E like data that can be used for adaptation and many being collected already within um, different sectors like I would say like for transportation um, is a good example like how frequently say um, metro stations flood or something like that so I think a lot of that data that's one of the things we talk about is you know building on existing data that's being collected because I think it is sort of they don't realize that there is an existing kind of for some cities, there would be um, an existing trove of data that's being collected that can be repurposed for adaptation and these um, purposes. And so I think that I think that is definitely true that one of the things we talked about in uh, the guidance is that, you know, kind of look at what you're doing already, see where there may be areas that you can um, adapt or, you know, if there is data that can be collected that can be fed into the system that exists already. So, yeah, that's definitely a good place for cities to start. I think that, that question also kind of goes back to the, the challenges of, of m and with an adaptation is, uh, is that there are a lot of activities being implemented out there that are adaptation activities that are not explicitly labeled as such. Uh, I mean, a great example would be uh, from from the work in CDO, their, their entire adaptation plan is essentially they, they identified activities out of existing action plans from other departments and copied and pasted those over to their action, their adaptation action plan, uh, and compile that into an adaptation plan. Um, I don't know if anybody saw the the cover photo uh, from from the presentation, but it was a picture of a uh, another city in the Philippines, uh, Iloilo, uh, that built an esplanade along the river. Uh, and the esplanade originally started as uh, there was a, a road that went along the river that citizens wanted to turn into uh, a pedestrian walkway. Um, and so the mayor said, okay, that sounds like a great idea. So they turned it into a pedestrian walkway. Uh, and then over time, um, they built, so you can, for those looking at home, if you want to uh, look, go earlier, but um, they built uh, stream bank protection. So they added vegetation in there uh, because they were experiencing flooding frequently from this river. So it sort of organically grew into an adaptation uh, activity, despite not being labeled as such until recently. It's now in their their adaptation plan. You know, future future uh, phases. They're, they're, plan they're planning on building a few more kilometers of this. Uh, you know, so the idea is that or the challenge is that you know they've they were they've of course been collecting M and E data on this. So it's a large construction project. They have an they have an understanding of how many kilometers of stream bank protection they've uh, they put in. They know how many trees they've planted along the riverbank. Uh, they had to settle something like 50,000 informal settlers who are along the river. Uh, so there's a lot of information there, but none of that has been used. 
aggregated together sort of give a broader picture of uh, other than sort of anecdotally controlling flooding, is this controlling flooding? Is this controlling flooding during uh, a five-year event, during a 50-year event? Uh, you know, so, so getting a better sense of how this will support their, their adaptation efforts going forward. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned that um, in the literature review you found that for cities often um, public reporting and transparency was a driver for why they wanted to have monitoring and evaluation and for their climate adaptation strategies. And I'm wondering what other factors you saw that were maybe motivating factors either for Sagayadora or other cities um, and specifically if uh, attracting private investment or investment in businesses was a factor for as opposed from the private sector taking the data and then adjusting it. Um, yeah, this is Sarah. Um, so we saw that there's definitely, um, actually in the case of Kenya, uh, the country example, um, that for them one of the main drivers of the system was to attract um, more financing through their you know, infrastructure needs. So that's definitely a driving factor. I think for cities, it's less so. Um, we didn't see any specific examples of it, at least. I think that, I think no matter what, you know, cities are trying to, um, you know, recognize that more robust, like a, a more robust project pipeline that has more investable projects is something that is needed for private sector investment. But I didn't see any specific examples that, um, you know, the m and &E would be part of that. I think the other reason that we saw one of the really driving um, factors for cities is the impacts that are already being felt from climate change. I think Rotterdam is a good example of that. Um, you know, that they are, you know, some, especially for cities that are um, coastal or in uh, coastal waterways that, you know, the, the survival of the city um, is really depends on it. So I think for them, you know, obviously the adapting to the impacts is one of the most important drivers um, of that. So that's kind of what we saw in, in our examples, but I, I don't doubt that I think it would also help in, um, you know, showing and improving uh, the project pipeline for, for private investment. Yeah, on the, in the guy in Doro is an example, and really in the Philippines, and this extends to a lot of developing countries. Um, I don't know if anybody's been to the Philippines in this room, but the uh, Philippines has a lot of malls. And the, those malls are, uh, you know, take up a huge amount of land, and the corporations that manage these malls are just larger property developers in general who have huge land holdings. Um, so they have, a, they have a large stake in ensuring that their property is protected from flooding, for example, landslides, those kinds of things. So uh, in, in Tagay and Oro, um, uh, the city mentioned it less, but the, the CSOs and the, and the university brought it up more. Um, but the private sector is, is uh, in the Philippines actually, there's a sort of an association of large private sector companies uh, that have formed sort of a climate change task force um, to, to push, push cities uh, towards these activities. Um, and so, uh, I mean, in CDO, for example, a couple of the larger land holding corporations uh, have been pushing the city on uh, developing green spaces and doing stream bank rehabilitation uh, to pr protect against uh, flooding, uh, particularly the catastrophic flooding in 2011. Um, and so really in their, you know, the, the, these companies' incentive is protection of their, their property and their assets, climate change corporations. Um, so I think we're, I, I wouldn't say that they're, the primary driving force, but the, I think they're certainly becoming more of a driving force in terms of uh, providing funding, insisting on certain activities, and then uh, in connection to M&E, insisting on showing results for their project. Thanks. Um, Uh, Dr. Walid Ali, environmental flood manager and the technical company in Egypt. 
called Mobco. And my question is, through your presentation, first presentation, you mentioned the three cities, I think Mexico City, Helsinki, Rotterdam, had the successful climate change adaptation plans, success plans. Don't you have case studies for uh, some other cities, the Middle East area, that had successful climate change adaptation plans or not? Sarah, do you want to answer that one since you did uh, the research and the literature review? Uh, sorry, I couldn't hear that well. Uh, to that question. The, sure. The so the question was about up. whether you came across any case study examples that looked at cities in the Middle East uh, or MENA region more broadly. Uh, okay. No, I did not. Um, specifically for city level um, adaptation, I'm going to need this really, really limited of what's out there. Um, and even uh, the new research that I'm seeing coming out, I have not seen anything um, from MENA, but I think it would be a, certainly an interesting place to look um, for, um, for in terms of you know heat impacts and, and drought. So that I think that could be very interesting, but I haven't seen anything. And I would also say that the, the examples that we included in the literature review, I don't know, you know if I would even term them successful necessarily. I mean, we didn't provide a sort of value judgment about whether or not they were achieving the, the goals that they set out. Um, but they were just, they just happened to be some of the few that we found that were actually uh, implementing an ME system and, and collecting data and using that data for reporting and, and decision making purposes. Um, so I think all three of them are, at this point are, are really so new. I don't think any of them are, are, are ME efforts or any older than maybe five years at this point. So it's still, there's still so little evidence really out there that uh, I think there's still probably in another five or 10 years, there could be a great literature review on sort of the successes and failings of these efforts. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I'm, I, I'm also working um, in Amman and Jordan and um, just anecdotally, they have a resilience um, plan, but have done nothing really much to implement it yet. And their plan involves no M&E um, framework whatsoever. So I, I think um, they're pretty far ahead in the region on some climate actions. So I think that's a kind of a good indicator of where people, cities are at. All right, I think we can, we have one time for one final question. Otherwise, that, I think we can wrap up. Um, I want to uh, thank everybody for their participation and for your questions and thoughts. I think this was a really interesting uh, presentation, both in discussing um, how cities are looking at measuring adaptation activities in particular and connecting those to national level agendas and, and I think more so uh, the opportunities that still uh, we have to improve data collection and just inspiration more broadly. So um, a lot to do, um, but, but progress is happening. Slowly. So um, all of these resources, both the presentation and recording of this webinar um, and the resources mentioned in the PowerPoint will be available online um, and you will get that distributed through uh, the event notice if you signed up uh, for Climate Links and, and we'll let you know when those uh, other resources and services are completed and I ask about you. Um, and with that, thank you so much uh, for joining us and we look forward to seeing you all in September. Thank you again to our speakers. Thank you all. Thank you, Kevin.